Welcome to the Chapel Grove Church Podcast, the Bible-centered show that focuses on searching the scriptures to find answers to common spiritual questions. To learn more, go to chapelgrovechurch.com. Hey everyone, today we'll be answering the question, what does the Bible say about suicide? This is a tough subject, not because the Bible isn't clear, but because this is such a sensitive topic that has far-reaching impact. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States, but that's when you lump all categories across all ages. In fact, if you go a little bit closer into the data, for 10 to 14-year-olds and 25 to 34-year-olds, suicide is the second leading cause of death, and it's a close third for ages 15 to 24. This is a big deal. In fact, in 2022, there were an estimated 1.6 million suicide attempts, and at least 46,000 of those attempts were successful. Now, I'm not trying to be depressing. I just want you to understand that with something as prevalent as this is, even if you've never struggled with it yourself, it's likely that someone near you may be struggling with this. And it's important to understand what God thinks about suicide. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible states that humans are made in the image of God. This foundational belief underscores the inherent value and dignity of every person. I would emphasize that taking one's own life disregards this divine image. The Bible is very clear about the sanctity of life. In fact, he goes on to say in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, "...whoever sheds the blood by man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image." He doesn't seem to take lightly the fact that he made man in his own image. That is a big deal. If we go a little bit further in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, the Bible says, you shall not murder. Suicide being self-murder falls under this prohibition. Life is a gift from God, and ending it prematurely is against his commandments. Now that seems pretty straightforward, and maybe I could end right there, but does that mean anyone who commits suicide is lost? Well, believe it or not, I don't actually think that it does. I don't think that just anyone who commits suicide is lost automatically. Another question one might ask is, what about people who are simply filled with despair and want to be dead? They'd rather be dead than alive. Is that a sin? Is that a sinful thought? I think sometimes we think as Christians that it is, but I don't actually believe that it is, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit here. Those are important questions to consider because oftentimes We are impelled by our society to be a positive people, and I want us to be positive. We should be. The Bible teaches us to rejoice and to have a joyful life. God built the world in such a way that he wanted us to enjoy the blessings that he gives to us, but it doesn't mean we're not going to go through some times of sadness and even despair. So let's talk about this for a moment. According to the CDC, Clinical depression and schizophrenia are among the top reasons that someone might have thoughts of suicide. Human beings, by nature, don't typically want to put themselves in harm's way. So, if someone leaves the umbrella of safety and intentionally harms themselves, there may be an instability that we don't know about, or maybe someone does know about. There's potentially a chemical imbalance. God is a righteous and merciful judge, and I want to emphasize how thankful I am that God is that judge, and it's not me deciding what happens to different people depending on the different things that they do. Psalms chapter 10 starts out asking, where are you, God? Throughout the first part of the Psalms, he questions, where are you, God, when bad things happen? And then in verse 14, he concludes, you, God, you do see the trouble of the afflicted. You do consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Throughout the Bible, God is described as the defender of the helpless, the God of the orphans and the widows, and the avenger of the righteous. And we need to remember that when considering the topic of suicide. One thing I do want to say before we go farther into answering the questions of what the Bible says about suicide is, if you or someone you know is struggling with this, please reach out to me or anyone at the Chapel Grove Church Podcast. We'll do everything we can to help. Or even better, I encourage you to call 988, which is the Suicide and Crisis Hotline, 988. It's not a sign of weakness to ask for professional help, so please don't just wait and hope that the difficult times will go away. Sometimes we need more help than than self-help. Sometimes self-help, I heard someone say recently that self-help is like decaf coffee. It tastes the same, but it doesn't have the same punch as actually getting actual help. But back to the Bible, what the Bible says about suicide, there are actually seven instances in the Bible where someone takes their own life. The first one is when Abimelech in Judges chapter 9, verse 54, 
he gets up close to a tower and a woman throws a rock over the tower and hits him in the head. And so he hastily tells the young man, his armor bearer, says to him, draw your sword and kill me so that the men don't say a woman slew him. And so his young man thrust him through and he died. That's one where some people consider that a suicide since it was by his own request. Second one might be Samson. In Judges chapter 16, verse 28 through 30, Samson, captured by the Philistines, asked God for strength one last time to bring the Philistine temple on himself and his captors, killing many in the process. Through through this act of destruction against his enemies, it resulted in his own death. And then King Saul, in 1 Samuel 31, King Saul, severely wounded in the battle against the Philistines, he didn't want his enemies to take him and torture him, so he fell on his own sword to avoid capture. His armor bearer, when he saw that Saul was dead, also killed himself. And then in 2 Samuel 17, verse 23, Ahithophel, which was a counselor to Absalom, he hanged himself, went home and hanged himself after his advice was not followed. He saw it as a sign of failure and impending defeat. Another time is in 1 Kings chapter 16, Zimri, a king of Israel, for a brief period, he set his palace on fire and died in the flames when he saw that his city was being captured by his enemy Omri. And then in the New Testament, we have Judas Iscariot, which some of you may be familiar with in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, hanged himself out of remorse after realizing the gravity of his betrayal. Now, I want to emphasize something. These suicides, except maybe Samson, if you want to use him as an outlier, these suicides occurred in context of deep despair, failure, or impending defeat. They highlight the extreme emotional and psychological states these individuals were in. Also, none of these suicides are presented with positive outcomes or as examples to follow. They're all typically portrayed as tragic and consequential. One other thing I'll say about this is you remember... Judas betrayed Jesus and out of remorse went and hanged himself. Remember that Peter also denied Jesus. But before that happened, Jesus, knowing what was going to happen, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And then he goes on to tell him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. But he said that I prayed for you, that your faith would not fail. When you turn back, strengthen your brothers. And that is what happens when Peter returns. He has remorse as well, but he doesn't have remorse to the point where he kills himself. He has remorse to the point where he strengthens his brethren. And so something I want to emphasize is that when you go through these very difficult and dark times, when you're fighting the shadows of life, one of the important things to remember is when you come out of that other side, you will you could potentially have tools that no one else will have. You'll be able to solve problems that potentially no one else could solve. But let's go back and talk a little bit more of the upstream things that that potentially could go through someone's mind, but upstream of the actual act of suicide. What would push someone so far to the edge that they would consider taking their own life? According to the CDC, again, there are two powerful emotions associated with suicide, or oftentimes. One is feeling like you're a burden, to the people in your life. And the second is that maybe you feel like you don't belong anywhere in the world. People at a higher risk of suicide often experience rumination, where they keep thinking about the same thing over and over again. So when thinking about these two emotions, if you feel like a burden, or if you feel like you don't belong first, I want you to know how desperately the world does need you. We really do need you. You have a unique experience that may be the exact blend that, that may be able to help someone else one day. Oftentimes, people hear the message that God loves them, but that doesn't translate into how much you are needed and you are needed. And the Bible, in fact, teaches this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 26, the Apostle Paul writes, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of, it, all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. 
And he goes on to say in verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We need to remember that, that you are important, even though you may consider yourself not as important, or maybe you consider yourself not to belong, you are needed. Secondly, if you feel like you don't belong or you don't fit in where you are, you're actually not alone. There's probably someone else near you who feels like they don't belong, and they could probably use your help. We briefly mentioned the secondary question earlier, and that was, what about people who feel despair? Is there something sinful about that? And I think it's important to talk about that as well. What, are, what about these emotions that sometimes we go through, but we don't really want to talk about or admit because we're supposed to be positive, we're supposed to be rejoicing, we're supposed to be happy. But as prevalent as suicide it's, is becoming, it's, it's important and helpful to go upstream and look at people who have wanted to die and what God's response was. There are actually several examples of people in the Bible who did. They wanted to die, and one in particular is the prophet Elijah, who requests that God let him die. If you're not familiar with Elijah, he's mentioned a few times in the New Testament, and we can read about him in James chapter 5. Spoken positively, James chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, the Bible says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain in the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And that is his claim to fame, so to speak, in the New Testament. But there's a lot more to this story than just what we read about here. So what it's referencing is is a story that occurred in the Old Testament during the reign of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, both names which are synonymous with evil and wicked people. And we can read about them in 1 Kings chapter 18 and chapter 19. We can read about Elijah and how much it bothered him that the people had turned away from God. As I mentioned, the king at the time was Ahab. Uh, When he married the woman Jezebel, she started influencing the people to worship the false god of Baal. And as a result of this, Elijah prayed to God that it wouldn't rain because he had a plan to get the people's attention. And so God allowed this to happen. God prevented the rain for nearly three years. And in the third year of this drought, God told Elijah it was time to go challenge Ahab. So Elijah went and met with Ahab and called him and and told him to bring the prophets of Baal to the top of Mount Carmel for a big showdown. And when they came to the top of Mount Carmel, 450 prophets showed up with Ahab. And Elijah said in first, verse 23 of 1 Kings chapter 18, let's get two bulls. Let you choose one bull for yourselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it. I'll prepare another bull. I'll lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. You call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And everybody thought this was a good idea. They said, it is well spoken. And so they did this. They chose a bull for themselves. They prepared it, got it ready for a sacrifice, and they started to pray to the God of Baal from morning until noon, saying, oh, Baal, hear us but there wasn't any voice. No one answered. They leaped about the altar that they had made. They weren't faking it. They really believed that this God would answer them. And so Elijah started making fun of them. He was confident. He said, cry aloud. He's God. Either he's, maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's sleeping and needs to be awakened. And I usually focus on the fact uh, of how joking it seems that Elijah was when he mocked this, but these are all very important things to think about. Is our God so busy that he can't hear us? The true God is not so busy. The true God can see you, can hear you. And it's interesting that Elijah mocks them, As uh, and then what happens later? But they did this. They cried out more. They cut themselves with knives and lances until blush, blood was gushing out of them, and they were waiting and waiting, but no one answered. No one paid attention. So finally, Elijah said, all right, everybody, come over to my altar. And he repaired the altar that the, of the Lord that had been broken down, and Elijah took 12 stones And he carefully constructed this altar while everybody watched, I assume in silence. And then he said, drench it in water. After he put the sacrifice on, they poured water on it, poured water on it. He said, do it again. They poured water on it. And then Elijah goes and he prays. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that this day you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. What is he praying for? He's praying that God would turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord. And when that happens, fire from the Lord falls out of the sky and consumes the burnt sacrifice, and it licks up the water that's in the trench. 
This is an amazing thing. And everybody in the crowd said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This is an incredible, this is an incredible victory on Elijah's part. But what happens next? Well, he goes and he tells Ahab, get up. We're going to have some rain. And he says, Ahab, you better run. You better get back to the, uh, there's so much rain coming that you better get back to the palace quickly. And Elijah runs and he runs ahead of him. I don't know if he was just excited to see that the the people of uh, Israel had now turned to God and, and to see this political change. But when he gets to the the palace, Ahab tells Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. And Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah saying, I am going to kill you for what you've done. And so Elijah runs. He runs a day's journey into the wilderness. He sits down under a tree. And what happens next? He prays that he might die and says, it's enough. Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. You know, there's a couple different reasons why someone may wish that they could die. According to health.com, there's some circumstantial challenges, which seems to be something that Elijah was experiencing. Um, some of the examples of those are dealing with the death of a loved one, um, legal challenges, going through a breakup, losing a job, having overwhelming financial troubles, all of things that can happen through the course of a life. Nobody's immune to these thoughts that they just like everything to end and everything to be over, including prophets of God. And so Elijah ran and he prayed that God would take his life. He said, please just let me die. And as he lay there sleeping, an angel touches him and says to him, arise and eat. And Elijah looks and he says, he sees that there's a, some food and a jar of water. So he eats and he drinks and he lays down again. And the angel of the Lord comes back a second time and touches him and says, go eat. The journey's too great for you. Because Elijah now has a, a long journey ahead of him. He arises, he eats, and he drinks, and on the strength of that food, he runs for 40 days and 40 nights, goes to Horeb, the mountain of God. And I think this is such an amazing thing, such a powerful lesson we can have in life. He has such, this, uh, such a depressing moment that he's ready to die, and he goes to the mountain of God. He's looking for God. In verse 9 of 1 Kings chapter 19, he enters a cave and he spends the night there, and it says, the word of the Lord comes to him and asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek my life. He's ready to give up. He says, there's no point in, there's no point in living anymore. And God says, go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And the Lord passes by and a great and strong wind tear into the mountains and break the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Bible says the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it says, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. I used to wonder a lot about why God used a still, small voice. Why was God in the still, small voice? Maybe a better question to ask is, why was he not in the fire or the earthquake or the wind, the tornado? Sometimes I look at this and think, think God is not the God of chaos. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as it is in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author of chaos or confusion. God is the author of peace. And when you're in your life looking at your, the different things that are going on, the insanity, the chaos of your life, the, the things that make life feel pointless, if you look to God and recognize that he has a point for the things that he's doing, he's not the God of chaos, he's the God of order, and he can bring order into your life. But he wasn't in the great strong wind this time. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. He was in a still small voice. He whispered to Elijah, said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah goes on to tell him his mission, why he's here. He says, I've been very zealous, zealous for you, but the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I'm alone and they want to kill me too. He's showing his desperation. He's saying, what's the point in living? What's God say to him? God says, go back. 
when you get there, I have a job for you to do. And then, P.S., I've reserved 7,000 people in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You're not alone, and there's more work for you to do. One of the things that's amazing to me about this is God wasn't mad at Elijah. I think sometimes we have a different view of God and how disappointed he may be in us when we may experience different emotions. God's not angry with us when we experience desperation or when we turn to him and are broken. God won't be mad at you. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. He was in the still small voice. And there's several things I think we can learn from this story. The first one, maybe the, maybe the most important, is that feeling despair is part of the human experience, even for those with a strong faith. Elijah's story shows that it's okay to feel overwhelmed as long as you're turning to God and seeking God's help. It's okay to feel overwhelmed and to feel like you're empty. And one of the second things is if you feel that despair, try to seek God's presence. Notice how Elijah immediately ran to find God. He journeyed for 40 days and 40 nights to get to the mountain of God. How many of us have spent that long in prayer, praying to God? Prayer is so powerful. You know, the book of Psalms is full of prayers crying out to God in times of desperation. Psalms chapter 56 verse 8 says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. I think it's a beautiful picture to think God holding his children, counting each one of their tears. He cares. He really does care. The third thing that I think we can learn that I already mentioned though, is God won't be mad at you if you feel that despair. God responded to Elijah's despair with compassion. He provided for his needs, and he gently guided him, and he had, and He showed him that he had more work for him to do. This teaches us that God really does care deeply for us. He wants us. He wants to help us through our struggles, but he also wants us to know that there's more work to do. He, he seems to almost not even really acknowledge Elijah's request to die, he says, go and return by the way you went. He had more work for him to do. The fourth point that I kind of want to make out of this is not to do it alone. Elijah, throughout this story, I know that you might make the point, well, he was alone, but God wanted Elijah to know that he wasn't actually alone. He reminded Elijah that there were 7,000 other people who hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. He wasn't alone. As lonely as life can feel, There are people who want to help. Elijah was a leader, but even Elijah needed rest and support. No matter who you are, try to find someone who will listen to you and who will help you when you're fighting those shadows of life. Don't do it alone. The times in my life when I've struggled the most and wondered what the point of it all was, there were some different activities that I would do that would really jolt me a little bit. So take these as personal antidotes. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. But these are things that have helped me personally. First thing is exercise. It's hard not to feel a little bit better emotionally and mentally after doing 50 kettlebell swings or 100 burpees. And if that's too much, just do something. Go for a walk in sunshine. Get outside and do some exercises. The second thing that helps me is journaling, writing out in a very detailed way all the things that are bothering me. But don't stop there. Don't just write out the negative things. For every difficulty that you write about, you need to write about three things that you're thankful for to remember that there's things that are worth being thankful for. The third thing that's helped me in the past too is cold therapy. You might laugh at this, but whether it's an ice bath or a cold shower, for some reason, shocking the system instantly improves my mood. And then maybe the fourth thing would be spending time with your family. Hug them. Practice saying, I love you. One friend told me that you need nine hugs a day to be healthy. And I don't know where they got that number or where they got that idea, but it's not easy to do, but it seems worth experimenting with. So try not to ever pass up on opportunities to show people that you love them. And then the fifth thing is to set your sights on a worthy goal. If you're willing to give up everything, if you really are thinking about giving it all up, Guess what? The world needs people like you, people who are willing to give up their life for something bigger than yourself. There are worthy goals to attach yourself to. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. I know this is, I know God is speaking to the people of Israel, but I think it's fitting how he looks at each individual who follows him. 
The Bible says, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. And listen to what Paul, the amazing apostle of Jesus Christ, and what he said in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9. He says, We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. You remember I told you that it's not uncommon to despair sometimes. Even Paul said, we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You are also you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. One other thing I'll say, because in preparation for this episode, I talked to somebody who has some experience in um, helping with suicide prevention, and she told me that helping people come up with a way, particularly kids, she's talking about kids particularly, but helping them come up with a way to verbalize their emotions so that they can express exactly how they're feeling as far as how bad a day or how good a day it is. A lot of times you come in, you might say, oh, this is the worst day ever. This is just the worst day ever. Well, is it really the worst day ever? If you can think about what the worst day ever might be, let's say you lose your parents, your house gets burned down or something terrible like that happens. Um, maybe that's on a scale of one to 10, a 10 being your parent, you lose all your family, lose all your parents. What are you really? Think about it on that scale. You say, okay, well, most of the time, you're probably more like a three or a four, or maybe a five or a six, but you're not at that 10 level most of the time. Most of the time, we outlive our darkest day. I'll tell you something that is additional that's interesting about this. There's a, there's a thing called alexithemia. Alexithemia is also called emotional blindness. It's a neuropsychological phenomenon that's characterized by significant challenges or difficulties in being able to express or describe your emotion. So alexithemia is basically, I'm not able to express how I feel. I used to work with a guy who was, was kind of like this. When he would get upset, he would just kind of start making strange faces and, and noises, but he wouldn't express exactly what, it, what he's going through. And interestingly enough, those who have alexithemia... Um, who are unable to assimilate their thoughts or their feelings or their emotions about what they're what they're going through, sometimes that results, uh, one of the side effects of alexithemia is it results in the persistence of that stress or that anxiety or that depressive uh, feeling. So they're, they're not able to express it, so they're not able to work through it. So giving that, using that tool, that one to 10, where are you really? Because a lot of kids don't have the vocabulary to, uh, uh, to express what they're feeling. A lot of adults don't have that vocabulary. We need to maybe equip ourselves or equip our kids, equip those who are around us. How are you really feeling? Give me a, on a scale of one to 10, 10 be the absolute worst day of your life. It's just another tool that I thought was helpful. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning that Elijah is found a couple times in the New Testament. One of the most interesting moments is when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain by themselves, and when Jesus was transfigured before them, where he became as bright as the sun, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as the light, and guess who appeared to him on the mountain? It was Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now, we're not told what the purpose was or what exactly what their conversation was about, but Elijah's goal was to turn the hearts of the people back to God, but he was rejected and he was threatened and Elijah wanted to die. And now here he is getting to speak with Jesus, the representative of the prophets. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what your struggles are, but the one who formed you says, I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. If you're ready to give up, I hope that you'll find community in the church. It's one of the reasons Jesus built the church, so that we could have strength with each other and to encourage one another, to provoke one another, to love and good works, to be able to overcome in times of temptation. That's our purpose. And if you're not utilizing that functionality of the church, then I encourage you to do so. Don't be afraid to talk to others about your struggles, that they can help you. So what does the Bible say about suicide? Probably says a lot more than we even realize. 
One thing to remember is it's never spoken of positively. It's not an example we should be following. But God is the judge of all, and he's the defender of the helpless and those who are afflicted. I'll leave you with one last verse, and that is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 through 20. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. So if you or anyone you know is struggling with suicide, or even if you don't, if you don't know anybody, pray for people as well. Keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Despair seems to be becoming more and more prevalent. Surround people with love, comfort, and hope. Let's be a community that supports and lifts one another. Pray for wisdom and courage to reach out for help when we need it and to be there for others in their times of need. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more, go to chapelgrovechurch.com. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. It helps others find us and lets us know how we're doing. Until next time, take care.